So it is related to the stuff we are we have learned in this class, um, but again, it is not a part of the curriculum. It starts with a review of one basic concept. Quick, what is Newton's <coughs> second law? Um, Goffin helps out. Uh, the net force equals mass times acceleration, and the force and the acceleration both back. This is Newton's second law. This is um, a linear version of Newton's second law. There also exists a rotational or angular version of Newton's second law, which is that the net torque, which is a vector, is equal to I times alpha, where alpha is also a vector. So this is the rotational version of Newton's second law. Now, I'm going to start on the right-hand side, where you can see instead of linear acceleration, there is angular acceleration. So you can see there are different pieces that match. This is linear acceleration, this is angular acceleration. We have force, we have torque, which is essentially rotational force. If you recall, force is the ability to cause a change in state of motion of an object. Torque is the ability to cause a rotational change in state of motion of an object. In other words, torque is the ability to cause an angular acceleration. Now, I takes the place of mass for the rotational version. So we're going to talk about what I is. I stands for, it is called the moment of inertia. Sometimes I will refer to it as rotational mass. That's not its technical term. Technically, it's called the moment of inertia. The reason I will call it rotational mass, however, is to help us realize what the moment of inertia is. So to understand what rotational mass is, we need to start with reminding ourselves what mass is. Nate, what is mass? Um, it is a measure of the inertia in an object. So we need to know what inertia is. George, what's inertia? The ability to resist motion. The ability to resist a change in state of motion. So mass is a measure of how much something will resist a change in state of motion or resist an acceleration. Moments of inertia is the measure of an object to resist an angular acceleration. So it is a rotational mass. It's a resistance, the measure of the resistance to a change in state of uh, angular motion or resistance to an angular acceleration. There are two different equations for moments of inertia. One of the equations for moment of inertia it is equal to the sum of the mass of the particles multiplied by r squared, where r is the distance <coughs> from the axis of rotation. And this is true for particles. We'll talk about the other equation in just a moment. So if I take two objects that have mass, and I talk about spinning while holding those two objects. You can see the axis of rotation would be a vertical axis of rotation, which would be right here. Class, when I take these two masses and I move them inward, what happens to R in the equation? Class, it decreases. What then happens to the moment of inertia? It decreases. So when I bring my arms in, the distance from the axis of rotation decreases, therefore the moment of inertia decreases as well. We'll talk about that further in just a minute. Another equation for the moment of inertia is the moment of inertia is equal to the integral of r squared with respect to mass. And this is for objects with shape, unlike point particles, which is what the, the other equation was. And you can see why we don't, why this is not a part of this class, because calculus, an integral is a part of calculus, is not a part of this class. If you do end up taking AP physics, we'll get to do a lot of that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so now we have conservation of linear momentum. <laughs> conservation of linear momentum is simply that the net inertia, uh, the net initial momentum is equal to the net final momentum. This is true during all collisions and explosions. We can also talk about conservation of angular momentum. The symbol for angular momentum is a capital L. So we have the sum of the initial <coughs> angular momentums equals the sum of the final angular momentums. 
where angular momentum is a vector. Um, let's see. Okay, so angular momentum, one of the equations for angular momentum is it's equal to the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular velocity. Angular momentum equals the moment of inertia times angular velocity. Now, this means we can substitute in moment of inertia times angular velocity for our angular momentum up here. So this is the initial uh, moment of inertia times the initial angular velocity is equal to the final moment of inertia multiplied by the final angular velocity. Bless you. So, I start right here. Moment of inertia, I'm sorry, angular momentum is conserved in the absence of an external torque. In other words, right now, if I don't push on anything, I cannot cause a torque on, my, on myself. Therefore, angular momentum is going to be conserved. So class, right now, what is my angular velocity? Zero. Zero. Therefore, what is my angular momentum? Zero. So notice that angular momentum is zero now, and as long as there's no external torque, it's going to remain zero. In other words, I cannot cause myself to rotate. Unless I reach over and cause an external torque. Right. So in the absence of an external torque, my angular momentum is going to maintain its constant value of zero. Okay, so now, Let's review. If I have the masses out here and I pull them in, what happens to the moment of inertia class? It decreases. If the moment of inertia decreases, what must then happen to the angular velocity class? Must increase. Must increase right? So if you look at that equation, when I bring my arms in, if I'm spinning, the angular velocity should increase which you can see right there. And this is a very basic principle, which all sorts of different athletes use, gymnasts, for example, divers, all sorts of different athletes use this basic concept where you can change the shape of your body to change the moment of inertia to change your angular velocity. Um, this, over Christmas break, I went to visit uh, my wife's family over in Washington, D.C. While we were there, there, we went to a playground, and on the playground there was a toy. This is a video that I could not resist uh, taking while we were at this playground. Please enjoy. You're now being taped. It's my turn. And that's the video. 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 All right. Who's push so I can't, I can't quite get you all in, John. There. So when I pull in, I increase the moment of inertia, which increases the angle of the Any parting words for your students? So Don't try that at home. No, look at the eyes. It's all in the eyes. It's, it's hard to see in that video, but when you just get off something like that, your eyes are going back and forth because you can't focus on anything. It's quite fun. All right. So that is just an example of conservation of angular momentum. As I went, got closer, as I pulled my body in closer to the axis of rotation, the angular velocity must increase. So, I cause the wheel to spin, I place it right here, I let go of it. This is, what is this? It's a child's toy. It's a top. More technically, it's a gyroscope, right? So we have a top or a gyroscope. This object 
is spinning. Therefore, it has angular momentum. This angular momentum has a direction. The way you figure out this direction is you take your right hand and you curl your fingers in the direction of the angular velocity. Your thumb is then going to point upward. This object has angular momentum. That angular momentum is conserved. Not only the magnitude, but the direction. So it tries to stay with the angular momentum pointing up. If it has no angular momentum, it will simply fall over because that angular momentum can still be conserved. It will still maintain being zero. This is the same concept that makes it so when you are riding a bike, it is easier to stay upright on the bike because the direction of the angular momentum of the tires tries to maintain a constant direction. Whereas if you stop, the wheels stop spinning and it's much easier for the bike to fall over. With this particular demo, usually I do, what I do is I stand in front of you like this for just a moment, and then I call on a student volunteer because no one really believes what's going on right here. Ah, uh, George, we did this last time. We'll go. Matt, come here. So, Matt, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to stand approximately right there. A little farther forward, to your left, right there. Good, place me, please. Okay, so what's going to happen here is I'm going to spin the wheel. When I spin the wheel, I'm going to hand it to you, if you could please take it. What I'd like you to not do is grab it like that, okay? What I want you to do is simply grab it like this. The idea being, if you hold it like this, you can apply a torque to it, to it you can prevent it from turning. So what's going to happen is you're going to hold it like this. Could you let go for a second? Now, while you're holding it, you are going to have to move. You'll understand that when it happens. What I'd like you to do, rather than moving from one location to another, I'd like you to simply stay in that place. You're just going to have to turn. You ready? Mm -hmm. Good. Hold up your hand, please. And there you go. And turn. You're going to turn your body. Turn your body. Oh, there you go. Okay. Do you really have any option but other than to do this? No. No. Okay. So that's the thing to understand is for some reason, thank you much. When students watch me do it, they say, well, why is he turning? Matt, why was I turning? Because you have to leave. Because you have to. You don't have much choice. Okay. If you could sit down. Okay. So here we go. This is the way it works. When this is spinning, it has angular momentum. That angular momentum, as we said, has direction. Please figure out the direction of that angular momentum. When you get out your right hand, it will now be pointed toward you. That angular momentum int interacts with the force of gravity, causing a torque on my body, causing me to go this way. So the angular momentum is toward you, the force of gravity is down, my thumb is, thumb is going to point that way, and therefore, the torque will cause my whole body to turn this way. If instead I change the direction of the angular momentum, please figure out the direction of the angular momentum. This time it is away from you, or this direction. Therefore, the angular momentum is this way, the force of gravity is down. Therefore, the torque on my body will be going that way. And as you can see, it will now turn this way. And it stays up. I don't actually have to hold it up because, again, because of conservation of angular momentum. As you recall, when I was seated here, in the absence of external torque, I was unable to cause myself to rotate. <laughs> the difference here is, when I apply a torque to the wheel, the wheel applies an equal but opposite torque back on me, and I can now cause myself to rotate. And that is how we position the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope is a telescope up in the sky. It can't actually push on anything to change where it's pointed. So what they have is there are six gyroscopes that are spinning in the Hubble Space Telescope and they apply a torque on the gyroscope, and then the gyroscope applies an equal but opposite torque back on the Hubble Space Telescope, and it can orient itself. The issue with this is that these gyroscopes are running 24-7, and slowly, if they're running 24-7, you're gonna have friction, and it's going to slowly degrade. We're actually down to, I believe, two gyroscopes that are functioning. We've replaced them several times, um, but there's an issue with that, because at this point, we don't have a space shuttle. We don't have a way to go up 
and maintain the Hubble Space Telescope. Slowly, those gyroscopes will fail. And when they do, we'll get to the point where the Hubble Space Telescope, we can't point it anywhere else. As I said, none of that is a part of the curriculum for this class. But alas, it is still interesting information. 